having the lights off helps me sleep too. Alright, so we went through some of this yesterday. We got through empiricism, materialism, idealism, rationalism, truth, belief, knowledge, philosophy, king, and forms. I just kind of laid these out. I believe we got so far as talking about true belief and, and knowledge. Um, our central question here that Socrates is attempting to answer is how do we know what we know, which is epistemology. I mean, it's epistemology, which is, this, um, which is itself the study of how do we know what we know. And I, I probably ranted a bit yesterday about the importance of that, because it's not just some academic question. It's much, much deeper than just that. It really does inform us. Um, I wrote those name, these names up on the board, Freud and, and Marx. And I was talking yesterday about how Freud, because of his materialist worldview, could never have discovered something like the collective unconscious. Whether you believe it exists or not, if it did exist, he, uh, that, that worldview would stop him from ever discovering it. Um, if there was such a thing as a spirit and a soul, Freud could never find it because he's limited by that worldview. By the same token, Jung was so open-minded that if there was no such thing as, as spirit and soul, he would have wasted a whole portion of his life pursuing those things, which he should have focused instead on the materialist. In other words, it isn't just a way of saying, hey, you should be open-minded. Freud would consider himself open-minded, but he would say, all the evidence points to materialism, so that's the avenue I'm going to pursue. Um, same with Jung. He would say, all the evidence seems to point towards there being something far more than just materialism, so I'm going to pursue that. But you find it, like whether, then you find someone like Marx, Karl Marx, and you guys know the name, Karl Marx? wrote the Communist Manifesto. The whole foundation of communism is atheistic. The idea there's no such thing as heaven, there's no such thing as hell, there's no such thing as good and evil even. There's only essentially power structures. And you'll see a lot of people today who operate like this. Like whenever you see the word critical in front of something, like critical studies, critical theory, critical this, critical that, it's essentially applying the, the Marxist approach to that, to that particular subject. And that particular, the, the, the central function, I'm sorry, the central kind of paradigm, we might say, the central lens through which that study examines the thing that we're looking at, like theory, whatever, is the idea that there's no such thing as right or wrong, there's only power. And that all of human history is a power struggle between oppressor and oppressed, or dominant and subdominant, and so forth. So whenever you see the word critical in front of something, it's always going to be Marxist. But the foundation of that is the idea that there's no such thing as, as good and evil. There's only power. And what that therefore means is that the ends justify the means. Should you wipe out a million people? Well, as Stalin himself said, the death of one person is a tragedy. The death of a million people is a statistic. So what I want to get across to us is that these are not just, again, like navel-gazing ideas of, well, who cares if so-and-so is, is a Marxist or if they're, a, if they're a materialist, if they're an idealist. There are, what, 50 to 70 million people in the Soviet Union who died in the, in, 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 uh, during Stalin's reign, who would suggest to you that it probably does matter that, that, uh, that Stalin was a materialist. 70 to 90 million people dead in communist China because Marx was a materialist, and therefore Mao Zedong was a materialist, and so on and so on and so on. This is not to say that materialist philosophy is inherently evil, all I'm saying is that it's something that can justify evil. And it's not the only thing. Most philosophies can do this. But I just want to get across to us that these things do matter um, deeply. Uh, we covered uh, empiricism. We covered idealism. We talked about rationalism, which is the combination between empiricism, uh, empiricism and um, idealism. Um, and we looked at the, the consequences of this of the view if all of our information is derived from our five senses, as empiricism says, we run into these problems. Our senses are often deceived. I talked about you're walking down the hallway, you thought you heard your name, you stick your hand into a, a pool of water, it looks like your arm bends. Um, we can understand academically why those things happen. And we, in other words, we can explain light refraction and, and sound carrying and things like that. But all that does is explain to us why our senses are deceived. It doesn't stop them from being deceived. So, 
Secondly, we seem to know things that we've never experienced before, things like perfection and infinity, things like justice. Um, we experience love before we understand what it is. So these are, um, yeah, consider that. And then finally, the implications of that is that if all of our knowledge comes from our five senses, then much of our knowledge is faulty because our five senses are often deceived. We drew a distinction between true belief, which is a belief that a person has that happens to be true, like a child who believes that one plus two equals three, because we've taught them to sing song that one, two, three, four, and they're just kind of singing along in that pattern. The child believes that one plus two equals three, but they don't understand mathematics. And Socrates believes that most of our knowledge is there, or our knowledge is there, versus true knowledge, which you have to be able to define a concept, you have to be able to explain it. Now, Socrates is going to say that you must also experience the thing in order to have knowledge of it. But what he means by that is going to be really precise. And as we're going to say, sorry, I combined say and see. As we're going to see, he argues that you already have all knowledge inside of you. Not in the sense of like, you know the right answer, but in the sense that you have experienced everything there is to experience in the universe. And so therefore, the process of, of having knowledge is simply to unlock what you already know. And as we're going to see, the function of the teacher, therefore, is not to tell you anything, but to just simply talk to you and ask you questions so that you can remember what you already know, as we'll see. Right. Questions about all that? Who said that? What's that? Who said who Socrates. Socrates. Yeah. That's, what, that's going to be part of his, his overall argument. Yeah. All right, so Socrates. Um, I have these dates down. 470 to 399 BC. Really important date. Because it's the date in which uh, the world changed. But by t most times that the world changes, we didn't realize it changed. I'll explain what I mean by that. And then Plato is his most famous student. Plato is his most famous student. You don't necessarily need to know his, his, his dates, but you, can, but you do need to know Socrates' dates. Um, then Plato has a very famous student, Aristotle. So Socrates taught Plato. Plato taught Aristotle. And then Aristotle's most famous student, as I said earlier, was Alexander the Great. And these things are fantastic, by the way. If, you're, if you type in like a, a famous historical figure and type in like CGI or something to that effect, there are these, um, I don't know, institutions that are taking the, like the busts, you know, the, the statues of very famous you know, historical figures and then creating them. So this picture right here is what, based off of the, the statues that we have of Alexander the Great. That's what we think he looked like in real life. It is good. Yeah, yeah, that's not a, that's not my thing, but yeah, it's a good looking dude. <laughs> yeah. I can see why you follow him. And he's also just, uh, I dig Alexander, man. I dig Alexander. He was kind also. He wasn't just like a, a, a guy who go in and murder people. He goes and conquers Persia. And he brings the, 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 you know, the king and the queen in front of him. And, he's, and what are they expecting? Well, they're expecting to be executed. And he kind of asks them, so um, what do you guys do around here? How do you guys govern yourselves? Well, we, these are our customs. And Alexander says, okay, everything will stay exactly as it is. Except rather than paying tribute up to the king and queen, you're going to pay tribute to, to me. And then I'll use that money essentially to help enrich your empire as well. So when he conquered places, he didn't just go in there with a sword and kill everybody who, who was living. He'd go in and conquer. There's a difference between a conqueror and a slayer. Uh, Genghis Khan, that guy, was a con that guy was a slayer. That guy would go in and just murder people. Probably the, the worst mass murder in history. I mean, Mao Zedong looks at that guy and he's like, man, it's hard to beat the king. But Alexander was not that guy. So Socrates taught Plato. Plato taught Aristotle. And Aristotle taught Alexander, who took the lessons he learned from, from Aristotle and goes and conquers most of the Mediterranean all the way to India. So that becomes his, uh, his, uh, his empire here. So, I don't know. Are you here to present? Yes, I am. Good awesome. morning. Stand by. <laughs>